Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Savadikap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom. Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be studying chapter 18 in the book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. This chapter is entitled, Eliminating Fears. Are you really scared? And I would like to just apologize for showing up a bit late to class today. I'm about 20 minutes behind schedule, a bit of impermanence for everyone. I actually dozed off a bit here and was not able to start class at the normal time. So thank you all for sticking around and thank you for being interested to learn these teachings of the Buddha because eliminating fears is something that is really important for this path to enlightenment. It's not something that we see directly on the path to enlightenment in terms of the eightfold path. However, as you learn this path to enlightenment, it is part of the path because an enlightened being wouldn't have any fears whatsoever. There's no fear of the dark. There's no fear of heights. There's no fear of any particular animal like spiders or snakes. And there's not even fear of death. And I titled this chapter, Eliminating Fears, Are You Really Scared? Because what you'll find out as we talk today is that you're not actually really scared. That's not the actual problem that is going on in the unenlightened mind related to fears. What's actually happening is the mind is holding on. There's this craving desire attachment that we talk about as the primary central problem that Gautama Buddha discovered in the unenlightened mind. And because of this craving desire attachment, the mind has this longing with a strong eagerness it has this interest to hold on to things and it just kind of gets bound up and holds on to things tightly. Well, what happens when the mind has fears is there's some type of conditioning that has occurred in order to create this fear. It could be that there was a certain experience in this life that you had, which you held on to that negative experience, which is causing the fear or There may be people that have taught you to fear certain things, which again is conditioning. And because of that teaching and those influences from other people, that's conditioned the mind to be scared. You can even have fears that didn't necessarily manifest in this life or something that you're holding on to in this life. It could be something that happened in a past life. But either way, the mind is holding on to something that is burdening the mind and now the mind becomes fearful of something that is causing the mind to kind of be unsettled or shaken up and this is something that needs to be eliminated as part of your path to enlightenment so just like all the other parts of this book in the buddhist teachings that i've taught about how to eliminate craving desire attachment through breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity, this is the kind of generalized antidote in order to solve craving desire attachment. In order to solve fears, there's one other aspect that you can actually employ in order to eliminate them from the mind. And with right mindfulness or awareness of mind, when you start to identify what the fears are, then when you know what your fears are, you can employ this other strategy. And what you do is essentially the fear in the mind, oftentimes what 
a person will do is they will kind of push away and they will kind of either ignore or run away or try to avoid this fearful situation. So if somebody is afraid of the public and being around a lot of people, they will typically retreat and try to be secluded and not around others. Or if they're afraid of spiders, they will try to get to a point where they never encounter spiders. Or if they're afraid of the dark, they will try to get to the point where they always have lights on, they'll maybe even sleep with lights on so that they're never in the dark. But the problem hasn't really been solved. All they've done is tried to create these conditions around them such that they won't ever encounter the thing that the mind is fearful of. So in addition to this breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity to start to generally work on eliminating this fear and the mind holding on, one of the other things that you can do is actually confront this fear and train the mind to actually reside with whatever it's fearful about so that it can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in that situation. So for example, if you or your children are afraid of the dark, the way to train them to no longer be afraid of the dark isn't to turn on all the lights and keep all the lights on around them and always ensure that they're not in the dark because at some point they will be in the dark and their mind will be fearful and it will be upset and it will be shaken up. So the way to train a mind to be comfortable with the dark is to actually go into the dark. So one of the things that you can do is with a child or even with someone who's older that maybe is afraid of the dark is be in the dark with somebody who you trust or that person trusts and turn off the light for two, three, four seconds show the mind that there's no harm, there's no nothing to fear, there's nothing that's going to bother the mind, and then turn the light back on after a few seconds. And then smile and be cheerful and, okay, you see, nothing happened. And then once they feel comfortable with that, turn off the light again now for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, and then turn it back on. And you go through this repetitive process over multiple times, over multiple sessions, to desensitize the mind to the dark because the mind is associating the dark with something fearful and something bad is going to happen. And what you've got to do is train the mind that nothing bad is going to happen when the mind is in the dark. And that's just one example. Or let's just say you're afraid of spiders. Then the same thing is you need to place the mind in situations where it's around spiders, where it's looking at pictures of spiders. Maybe you go to museums and you see kind of an insect museum where there's spiders and kind of show the mind and train the mind that there's nothing to be fearful of. Or sometimes people might get in a car accident and they have a really bad car accident and they remember that and then they're very afraid to get in the car and go on any future transportation where they're in the car. And you've got to slowly train the mind through placing the mind in the car, driving around the block, coming back, and kind of showing the mind there's nothing to be afraid of. That was just a one-time incident, a one-time experience where there was an accident, but the mind is holding on to this conditioning and this fear and that's why it continues to experience the fear because it hasn't confronted the fear and oftentimes what people will do is they'll just try to avoid the situation but then that can be very problematic for life because you're going to find yourself for example needing transportation and needing to be in a car or you're going to find yourself around the situation where maybe you're in public and you need to be in public and if you avoided that situation it could be problematic for your life you wouldn't maybe be able to work you wouldn't maybe to go to school you wouldn't be able to go shopping and things like this so the mind needs to try to figure out what things that you're actually afraid of so that you can train the mind to eliminate that from the mind you even need to get to the point where you no longer fear death death itself is something that a lot of people will fear 
So if the mind fears death, then there's some fear there in the mind and it's not going to attain enlightenment because there's something holding back in the mind. It's holding on to this fear. And oftentimes where this fear comes from is that people have been taught, i.e. their mind has been conditioned to believe that there's only one life and you only get one life. And when you die, you're judged based on the totality of your entire life And you either go to a good place or you go to a bad place. And if you did things bad enough, uh, then that bad place is forever and it's permanent. And you're always going to be there in that bad place. This is oftentimes what is taught in some traditions. But the more you learn these teachings and you understand things like impermanence, you know that nothing is permanent. So you know that this teaching of you go to a bad place and you're there permanently isn't true. When you learn about the natural law of gamma and the the cycle of rebirth and your mind starts awakening and you start learning all these teachings to be the truth, you may even start to observe past lives at some point. Then you start learning that this teaching of you just get one life you die, you're judged on the totality of your life when you go to a good or bad place isn't actually true. And you can start regaining control over your life and realizing that you have the ability right now to make a better life for yourself and improve whatever situation is going to happen once you die. And you don't need to fear that actual death, that that's just part of this whole natural cycle of rebirth and these natural laws of existence. So we need to even train the mind to get to a point where there's no fear of actually death itself, but it just sees that as one more step in this cycle of rebirth because you've already been born and died countless times. You may not remember that right now, but you have been. And dying in this life doesn't mean you're going to be judged by any particular entity of whether your life was good or bad and you go to either a good place or a bad place permanently. That's not actually the truth of what actually happens in real life. But the more you learn and understand this, the mind can kind of let go of any fear that you might have of death. Or perhaps you may even be fearful of the way that you're going to die. Some people have fear of Is it going to be painful or maybe they might fear leaving loved ones that are here and if they die, that means they're going to leave those people. And this is, again, craving, desire, attachment. So there's all these sorts of things that you need to sort out as part of this path is in addition to everything else that we've talked about on this path is it's important to take an inventory of what the mind is fearful of so that you can actively train the mind to undo that conditioning so that the mind can then reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy when it no longer has these fears. So I'd like to just kind of pause and open things up for discussion. And as part of our discussion, I would like to even invite you, if you would like, to share some of the things that you might be fearful of that you feel like you might need help eliminating because you might have questions about what I've discussed so far, but you may already be aware of certain fears that you have and you're not quite sure how to put together a plan to actually address the fear, to eliminate it. And what I can help you with is help you kind of understand how to put together a plan to gradually train the mind to eliminate a certain fear that you might be having. So I'd like to turn things over to Max to see if there's questions in Facebook, YouTube, in our Zoom classroom. And remember that if you just type your question into the comment section of any of those platforms, either Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, Max will see it and be able to ask your question for you. Or if you're in Zoom, you have the ability to raise your hand to ask your question directly or ask any follow-ups. Thank you, David. So I suggest we go to Michael first, who has his hand up. So perhaps, Michael, you'd like to ask a question live. Yes. And actually, I just wanted to share my experience of um, regarding fear, right? It was uh, around uh, December or January, right? 
I've already done research and new information about the coronavirus coming in, right? So with that, like I had the research, I was already aware of it. I was feeling like anxiety, right? So I had to I had to do some like preparing. It made me accumulate, like you know, ho- hoarding stuff just to like um, get a lot of stuff to prepare because of I was I was scared of some doomsday event that was gonna happen and. You know, a few months later, even till now, like nothing really affected me. It wasn't really much. So that pretty much that preconceived fear of the future affected me a lot, and it gave me anxiety before. And that craving to to accumulate to to hoard, but now I'm aware of it, and and that everything would always be fine. So that was a great lesson of fear that I've want to share yeah so michael these fears like i was kind of mentioning as i talked is it's the mind still craving permanence right we know that the unenlightened mind just does not like impermanence whatsoever any kind of change the mind typically really doesn't like that it craves something permanent so if the mind craves like for example no spiders and it just wants to never be around any insects whatsoever it's craving that permanence and then when a spider comes into your life the mind becomes fearful or a mouse or something like this or in your case maybe your mind was craving this permanent stability of life where there's no sickness and no illness and when this pandemic rolled around a lot of people became fearful of what that means for the world, what that means for their own individual life, what it means for their job, their occupation, their family. And this pandemic of COVID-19 coming into the world represents an enormous amount of impermanence that for some people created and elicited and brought to the surface a lot of fear and panic. And we saw this in places like America where there was enormous amounts of buying where people went to stores and they just started hoarding all of these supplies remember early on it was toilet paper paper towels Mm -hmm. hand sanitizer all of this kind of stuff people just started hoarding it and hoarding and craving and they felt like if i just have one more roll of toilet paper my mind will be content or if i have just one more roll of paper towels or just one more bottle of hand sanitizer but what those people maybe didn't consciously realize but at some level they eventually realized is that that one more roll of toilet paper isn't going to make the mind any more content than it was previously or one more bottle of purell gel or hand sanitizer and this is a symptom of the same problem which is this unenlightened mind that's craving this external satisfaction and oftentimes when these fears come up the mind goes into this extensive amount of craving and kind of neurotically makes these reactive decisions like what we saw Mm -hmm. at the beginning of covid where people went around and started hoarding a lot of things so yeah what you're describing is very normal if somebody is scared of covid out there if you are watching this and that's one of the big fears that you have you need to train the mind to understand where we are in the world that yes we have this illness and we have lots of other illnesses as well and what you need to do is you need to have informed wise decision making in order to eradicate this fear so we know enough about covid now that if we are at home and limit our contact with others this is a good way to reduce our potential of having covid or getting covid we know that if we wear a mask that when we do go in public that this is very helpful we know if we social distance this is very helpful we know if we wash our hands often this is very helpful and we know that there's some vaccines that look like they're starting to come onto the market here soon as well so these things can help you to regain control over realizing that you have the ability to make informed decisions of completely reducing the potential of you actually having or contracting covid but even with that you may still end up contracting it and if you do 
the likelihood of you dying is somewhat low because the death rate, I think, is somewhere around 5% or so, which is still too much. I mean, it'd be great if there was no deaths whatsoever, but the likelihood of someone dying is, is somewhat low. So we need to take wise decision making to have preventative measures to potentially not have covid but then if we do contract COVID, we need to understand that it's not necessarily a death sentence and the mind doesn't have to worry and be fearful. But if for some reason we do die having contracted COVID, then that's the impermanence of this life and we're going to die. And there's, if you're not enlightened or you don't attain enlightenment at death, then there's going to be rebirth at some point in the future. Death isn't final if you haven't attained enlightenment. So there's this whole spectrum of understanding and it's often hard for that to come in, into being with something like a global pandemic, which is something that most people have never experienced in their life ever, unless you were alive a hundred years ago. I think it was the Spanish flu was kind of the last real global pandemic that affected so many people like this. So. This is something that the COVID-19 fear is something that you can make wise decision making and train your mind to not be fearful of. And the other thing that you can be aware of in terms of fears and helping you to reduce any fears, not just about COVID-19, is that this natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, essentially the result of your decisions, it's all based on harm. Whereas if we don't cause harm to others, no harm will come to us. It doesn't mean that you're never going to die because everybody needs to die. But if you don't cause harm to other beings, no harm is going to come to you. So one of the things that people do and the ordained practitioners will do this is they will go out into the forest here in Thailand and out into the jungle. And if you know anything about a Thai jungle, is it can be a very, very scary place. So for me, growing up in America, I was playing in the woods all the time. We were in and out of the woods as children all the time, but that's not something they do here in Thailand because the forest or the jungle has tigers, has bears, has poisonous snakes and spiders, has all kinds of things that can hurt you and hurt you where the, you actually die in the jungle so what people do in order to train their mind is they know this natural law of gamma as if you don't cause any harm no harm will come to you so monks ordained practitioners will oftentimes trek off into the forest and they will meditate in the forest for multiple days at a time and the way they train their mind is they know that if they don't cause any harm to any beings around them that there's no harm that will come to you. Now, I've never heard of a monk being attacked by tigers or bears or poisonous creatures in the forest. I'm sure it's happened at some point, but they go into the forest every day, day in and day out, pretty much. They have this practice of meditating in the forest to train the mind that there's nothing to be fearful of. And they don't just go in the daytime. They actually spend the night, multiple nights at a time in the forest, helping to show the mind that as long as they don't cause any harm to any beings, no harm will come to them. And this is the type of thing that you can do and desensitize the mind to all these various fears that are held in the mind. And the more you understand the natural law of gamma and you observe it in real life, you know and you will be able to see that as long as we don't cause any harm, no harm will come to us. And in fact, the whole reason why COVID exists, which some of you have heard me talk about before, is because as a human species, we've been causing harm in the world through ingesting animals. We've been killing animals. And this is what happened in that market in China, is there was this market that was set up to sell living beings, to kill living beings, to ingest living beings and meat. And because of this close contact between humans and living beings and the killing of living beings, this is where the COVID virus 
jumped from the animal world into the human realm and now that's why we're having to deal with it so much but we caused this you know early on there were some people saying you know god is punishing us for something or other you know they came up with all different kinds of reasons some of them i'm not even interested in repeating all the different reasons why people were saying god was punishing us with this covid virus well that's not what god does and we'll talk about that next week that's chapter 19 that god doesn't punish people and god doesn't reward people what happened is due to our own actions the result is that this virus jumped into the human world and is now affecting the entire world it's from our own actions so when you learn more and more about the natural law of gamma you can start to reduce this fear for example with something simple like being in the dark as long as you're not causing any harm there's nothing to be afraid of because there's nothing that's going to harm you because you haven't caused any harm in that situation and one of the things that happens with the mind is when the mind doesn't know true reality when the mind doesn't understand the natural law of gamma when the mind doesn't understand this eightfold path when the mind is practicing and being harmful when we're harmful in our speech and our actions the mind can be neurotic and being afraid of things like death because you know internally that you're not really doing things well in the world and you're kind of afraid of what might happen to you when you die but when you learn this path more and more and you realize that you're not causing any harm to anyone and the more that you're not causing harm to anyone then harm doesn't come to you people don't even speak harmful to you so this can help you to not be afraid and we can kind of use today as an example when I happened to finally wake up and realize that it was 9.15 and I looked at the clock, I was like, oh my goodness, it's 9.15, I need to get online. There's some obligations that I had promised people that I was going to be teaching today at nine o'clock. I wasn't afraid, I wasn't fearful because I know I hadn't done anything wrong. I had just dozed off to sleep and this was impermanence. So my mind can be stable, can be peaceful, can be calm and serene with joy because I know that I didn't cause any harm to anybody overtly, right? By not showing up, that's not causing harm to anybody. I didn't cause any intentional harm. I just dozed off to sleep. You know, maybe I've been working too much. Maybe I've been too active and things that I've been doing here. So when I did show up and I saw there was, you know, several people waiting in the classroom, the Zoom classroom, you know, I apologize. There's nothing for me to be afraid of. There's no harm that's going to come to me. And not one person said anything bad or harmful to me because I didn't cause any harm to anybody. So therefore, no harm came to me as a result of this not showing up to class on time. So the more you learn about the natural law of gamma, you can reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because you know all of your intentions, your speech, and your actions are coming from a pure, wholesome place of loving kindness and compassion. So because you're not causing harm in the world, no harm is going to come to you. We have a follow-up from Shital. She asks, what is the definition of harm here? That's a very good question harm is hurting others right hurting others through your speech or your actions and we have to understand that harm isn't when somebody causes their own discontent mind because you can't cause someone else's mind to be discontent so if i speak without the five factors of well-spoken speech which are speaking at the right time what we say is true what we speak is gentle, we speak beneficially, we speak with a mind of loving kindness and blamelessly. If I don't practice those, I am causing harm in the world. But if someone's mind becomes discontent due to me not practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech, they're the ones who are causing their mind to be discontent, but I cause the harm, which then potentially there's going to be harm that comes back to me. There essentially will be. If I go around 
the world not speaking at the right time, if I'm constantly interrupting people and not speaking at the right time, or if I'm speaking at a time where other people are angry and hostile and I'm trying to jump in and teach them a lesson during that time, or if my mind is angry and hostile and I try to speak during that time, you can guarantee that I'm causing harm because I'm not speaking at the right time. So therefore, people are gonna do those same things to me. People are going to interrupt me frequently because I do that to them. Or if I speak without the truth and I lie and I go around lying to people all the time, this is causing harm in the world. So you can guarantee that there's gonna be people around me, friends and family, who are also lying to me. If I speak harshly with words that are bad word choices that are causing harm, if the tone and tempo of how I speak is hurtful and it's not gentle, you can guarantee people are gonna speak that way with me. If I speak in a way that's unbeneficial, just frivolous speech, you know, no real purpose behind it, you can guarantee that people around me will speak that way as well. And if I speak without a mind of loving kindness, which loving kindness is active goodwill towards all beings without judgment. So if I spoke the opposite of that, it would mean I speak with ill will and with judgment towards others. And this other aspect of the five factors of well-spoken speech is speaking blamelessly. So if I go around blaming people and complaining and telling people it's their fault about certain things that are happening, you can guarantee this is the way people are gonna speak with me because I'm causing the harm in the world. But if someone's mind gets discontent because of that, that's their mind doing that. But I created the conditions of the harm, which now this harm is gonna come back to me. And we could go through actions and kind of look at the same thing where bodily actions can cause harm, where like if I punch somebody, this is causing harm. So you can guarantee people are gonna punch me back. When I grew up as a kid, from age, I would say about from fourth grade to about sixth grade, I was a bully. I went around and I bullied people on the playground. I, you know, fought and I talked bad to people and I uh, disparaged people in fourth, fifth and sixth grade. And I just thought I was the biggest, baddest kid on the playground because I had failed third grade. So I was a bit older than all the other children in my class. So I, I had the reputation of being the bad boy and I would go around and bully people, fourth, fifth and sixth grade. Well, by the time seventh, eighth, ninth grade rolled around, there were people in my community that started bullying me. I had stopped bullying because I learned to not do that anymore. I got in a lot of trouble in those three, four years that I was bullying people. I got in a lot, a lot, a lot of trouble. Well, even though I had stopped bullying people, the reputation was still out there of who I was. So as I got a little bit older and I went into like high school at a grade nine, well, then the older kids, grade 11 and 12, I got bullied tremendously when I got older. And this was my gamma coming back to me. So you can never run away from any harm that you cause in the world. And this harm is going to come back to you in some form or another. And the way that you don't cause harm is by learning and practicing the Eightfold Path and by you not causing harm through those steps of the Eightfold Path that the Buddha helps you to understand you're not causing harm in the world. So therefore, harm's not going to come to you. Even if you are speaking with right speech, or even if you are practicing right action, there's people whose mind might become discontent and they might yell at you or become hostile at you, but that's not necessarily because you're causing harm to them. But at that point, your mind might be so well protected by the Eightfold Path that this harm that they're trying to inflict through their hostile speech no longer causes the mind any harm because your mind is protected. Your mind no longer experiences discontentedness. So it doesn't mean that your life is perfect and nothing ever goes wrong in life. Once you 
fully practice this Eightfold Path and are no longer causing harm in the world, it doesn't mean everything's perfect. So you can still have situations where people might be hostile to you or aggressive to you. But by the time you train in this path and your mind is so well trained, those things no longer cause harm to the mind because the mind is now protected and so well trained that when somebody becomes hostile with you, you just see it for what it is and it no longer affects the mind. And you know by the time you get to enlightenment that when somebody speaks hostile to you, you know that the wrong answer would be to speak hostile back to them. Where now in the unenlightened mind, if someone speaks rude or impolite or disrespectful to you, you might react with hostility and aggression back towards them. But then that's just going to keep the hostility and aggression keep happening in your life. It's not until you eliminate the harm that you're causing in the world through this eightfold path that over time, less and less people will be treating you with hostility and aggression. And then when that stuff comes to a complete bare bones minimum, then even when somebody speaks up occasionally and is rude or hostile to you, it doesn't affect your mind at all because it's no longer shaken up. And there's a good example of this in the Buddhist teachings where the Buddha was actually enlightened. So he had completely extinguished all unwholesome gamma. He no longer experienced a discontent mind. His mind was peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. But even during that period of his life where he was enlightened, he had a murderer come and try to attack him and was chasing after him with a sword. So it's not that when you're enlightened, you'll never experience any challenge in life ever. But the Buddha had the wisdom at that point and he wasn't afraid because he knew that he hadn't caused any harm. So therefore, no harm was going to come to him. So when this person came with the sword to come try to attack him, the Buddha remained calm and peaceful. And he just actually shared some wise comments that this person didn't actually use the sword against the Buddha. And the Buddha was able to kind of subvert this situation in a very wise way that he didn't have any harm come to him. Now, if his mind was unenlightened and it was shaken up in this fear, when this person was chasing after him with the sword, things could have gotten really bad. And this is one of the reasons why we need to eliminate fear is because if somebody comes chasing after you with the sword in the Buddha's case, and if he would have say ran, or if he would have talked bad or aggressive or maybe he would have fought the person right away, you know, instead of trying to somehow otherwise solve the problem, this could have actually made the problem worse. And that's one of the reasons why we need to get rid of fear because fear doesn't actually help. It doesn't improve the situation. It just makes the mind neurotic and shaken up. And when the mind's shaken up, you're gonna make less wise decisions, which can actually cause more problems when the mind becomes discontent. So if I'm sitting here and I'm afraid of a mouse and a mouse walks into my room and I get all hysterical, I can actually cause harm to my own body based on the fear and the discontentedness. So by being able to train the mind to eliminate fear and recognize that if you don't cause harm in the world, no harm's gonna come to you, then you can actually remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, and you will experience a peaceful life. But there will be challenges that come along the way, but with the wisdom of these teachings, you'll be able to address those challenges and you won't be shaken up by them. We have a question from Rhonda. From being in cutthroat corporate America for over 30 years, I find my norm is fear of ambush and ulterior motives of others. I observe myself and see how irrational it is, but the physical anxiety is palpable. I am working hard to rewire it. Any insights is so welcomed. Fear has immobilized me at times. 
Yeah, so I worked in American corporate world as well and worked my way up into management. And there was a lot of people that were, you know, kind of fighting for the director job or the VP job. And there was the potential for people to gossip about you or sabotage your actions and all of these kind of stuff. Even though I wasn't as aware of the teachings back then as I am now, looking back to that time, I was practicing the teachings without even realizing what I was doing. And I didn't have the fear that other people had in corporate America because I knew innately that I wasn't doing anything to harm anybody. I wasn't doing any backhanded stuff. I was managing the teams that I managed very well. And because of this, I had a great reputation in corporate America and I had teams that were growing and growing and growing this first job or actually no it was my my um probably second or third management job i took over a team of about 30 people and i had that job for about 10 months before i finally left it but i had this job for about 10 months i took over a team of 30 people but because i was so successful i grew the team to 55 people in just 10 months And even though I was brand new to this company, I'd never worked in this company before, I had a really good reputation in the company and people really enjoyed working for me because they knew that if they were on my team, David wasn't pushing his employees and like trying to squeeze every little bit of productivity out of them. They knew that David was very interested in helping them as an employee in order to grow their skills and grow their capabilities. I knew that they weren't going to be working for me permanently. And my goal was to help them grow their skills so that they could benefit my teams that they worked on, but then set them up to the point where when they got another job, they had more skills and abilities. So working on my team meant that they were being built up and they were being encouraged and supported and empowered to build their career. And I saw them being on my team as a stepping stone for them in their career. So if you're in corporate America or anywhere in the corporate world that tends to create competition of people clamoring to the top, if you're practicing these good wholesome teachings where you're practicing right view, accepting responsibility for your own feelings and emotions and realize that you cause your discontentedness, therefore you can eliminate it. You're practicing right intention, which is harmlessness with the intention of not causing harm to others. When you practice right speech, which is the five factors of well-spoken speech, which includes not gossiping, not slandering, not disparaging others, not talking with deceit, practicing all those five factors, including the things that I just talked about, you know that you're not causing any harm to anyone in your company. And when you're practicing right action and all these other good, wholesome teachings, you can have confidence and you can eliminate any fear because if anybody attacks you or attacks your reputation or attacks your work in your career, then you know that you're only doing wholesome things in the world and it's just a matter of ensuring that you continue to do those and that if somebody attacks you or attacks your career or attacks your knowledge, then that's their practice. That's what they're doing. No harm can come to you if you're doing everything above board and you're not causing harm to others. And this is the reason why in my career, when I was in the professional world, I never had any fear about work ever. And even though I was working in a lot of different companies, I never feared any kind of backstabbing or backhanded techniques because there was nothing anybody could do to me because I was always following the company policies. I was ensuring that I was treating people well and doing good things in the companies where if I was a manager who was stealing money from the company or I was doing backhanded things, then that's the opportunity for the mind to become fearful because it knows that it's doing things wrong. So if you know that you're practicing these good, wholesome teachings of the Eightfold Path and you're not doing anything wrong, then people can attack you. But whether they're successful or not is a whole nother question. So if you don't give anybody anything that 
you're causing harm to the company, then people can attack you all day long, but there's no evidence of you doing anything wrong. So therefore, no harm is going to come to you. We have a question from Neil. Buddhism talks a lot about letting go. Is it normal to have fear about letting go and losing yourself? Who are we if we are not the ego? Yeah, so I've heard people mention this and I experienced this as well, some fear and letting go and letting go of the self and the self identity. I've talked before, Neil, about how it feels like you're walking off a cliff when you're letting go of this self, you know, the self identity, the self image, and you're letting go of this arrogance and pride and you know, these things that you are aspiring to do in the future, you're needing to let all that go and reside in the present moment. It doesn't mean you're never going to accomplish those goals. It just means you have to let go of that craving, desire and attachment towards those objectives and those outcomes. So, yeah, there can be some real fear in that because the mind has been taught that if you plan out, right, this is what we're taught in Western culture typically, that you plan out your three-year plan, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, and there's a certain amount of security that the mind feels with that, right? And you gain this sense of who you are, and there's a certain amount of security in that. And the mind feels like there's some level of security in this three-year, five-year, 10-year plan. And there's some amount of security and kind of being confident of knowing who you are or maybe even prideful about who you are. But what you realize, the more time that you spend practicing these teachings, is there's no guarantees in life whatsoever. And while we're taught that having this three-year, five-year, 10-year plan is a way to kind of develop this security in the mind, all that gets shaken up with something like COVID, right? Or some economic downturn or some recession or something like this, if the mind's fearful of the future, right? Like some of us have kind of been taught to be fearful of poverty and homelessness. And this is kind of what motivates people in a capitalist society to work, 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 nose to the grindstone. And if you're fearful of that homelessness or poverty, then it can kind of push the mind to excessive amounts of craving to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and it makes the mind neurotic. But what you realize is there is no guarantees in life. And while the mind might feel more secure to have this three, five, 10 year plan, in reality, we don't really know what we're gonna be doing an hour from now or two hours from now, right? And, and just using another example from today, like I had every intention to teach class at nine o'clock, but whoa, you know, I woke up at 9.15, I was like, whoa, I haven't been, you know, there's people waiting for me. So even though in, in the mind, I had thought and I had the goal and I had the objective to teach class at nine o'clock, when I finally woke up at 9.15 and realized that I needed to get online and teach, then I didn't even know what was going to be next because here I am at eight o'clock. I just kind of like sat on my bed and was like, oh, it's eight o'clock. I've still got 30 minutes before I normally log in, which is 8.30, which is normally when I log in. I was like, oh, I'll just sit here on the bed and kind of close my eyes a little bit. That'll be fine, you know? <laughs> and I did that. And then next thing I know, it's 9.15. So we don't even know what's going to happen an hour or two hours from now. We think we know. The mind wants to believe that it knows. And we put together these plans thinking that we know, but we really don't because of impermanence. And if we don't train the mind to understand impermanence, then the mind can be utterly shaken up from any one particular experience. So you've got to let go. And that can be fearful at the beginning and even as you get going and even as you start to realize non-self and you start to let go so much, it can be quite fearful because the mind's been trained to hold on and hold on and hold on. But the way that this works is gradual training. If you try to make these real abrupt changes in your life, that's typically when the mind revolts and gets shaken up the most. This is why when someone dies, the mind typically gets shaken up a lot because it's a very abrupt change that the mind doesn't like. So the best way to approach this path is gradually over time, 
where you're gradually training the mind through meditation and all these other teachings. And this kind of slowly erodes the self identity, the self image. It slowly erodes the ego and it slowly erodes some of these other things in the mind like craving, desire, attachment, hatred, anger, ill will, delusion, ignorance, unknowing of true reality. And all of these things that need to be eliminated from the mind kind of slowly erode. Whereas if you take this real aggressive, harsh approach to it, it can be somewhat unsettling to the mind. So that would be my suggestion for you that if you're feeling some fear of letting go is just recognize that you really don't know what the future holds. You really don't know at all. And that's the whole idea of getting the mind comfortable with not knowing what the future is and just residing in the present moment and anything that comes about any situation any challenge in life that comes about just know that you have enough wisdom on board to face that challenge and that can be really empowering that you don't have to worry or feel anxiety about the future and what may or may not happen you can just reside in the present moment and just know that you have the wisdom that you need to address any challenges that come about we have a related question from michael David, can you explain about how fear and protecting the self slash ego is related, relating to when the ego is being attacked? Yeah, so the ego loves to protect itself. So remember last week when we talked about the ego, the ego is made up from the self, which is the personal existence view. And what we're calling ego also has this component of conceit or arrogance or pride this measuring and comparing to be above or below people. So when we say the ego, and I say the ego likes to protect itself, essentially what I'm saying is the self doesn't want to let go. This self that's in the mind, this permanent self that the mind walks around with thinking that there is a permanent self, essentially the mind is falsely identifying this physical body in this mind as being the self and because of that false identification of the self and that there is a real self here the mind holds on and holds on and holds on to this personal existence view and then because of this arrogance and this pride this measuring and comparing putting oneself above or below others the mind doesn't want to let go because the mind's so arrogant and prideful. It thinks that it's better or worse than other people and kind of disparaging others or disparaging yourself. So we call all of this the ego. And this stuff is really hard to let go of because the mind holds on to this self and holds on to this conceit. And that's its way of protecting itself. The ego, like I mentioned last week, is kind of like a bad tenant. It doesn't do anything good in the mind, but yet it keeps holding on and holding on and holding on. So it's like a bad tenant who never pays rent, but they just keep staying in this dwelling over and over and over again and never wants to leave. So this is kind of like its own protection mechanism. And you kind of have to fake out the ego and you kind of have to almost treat it like a third entity and that you're going to gain control over this. So when the mind doesn't want to be humble, it doesn't want to be peaceful, it wants to be arrogant and prideful, you've got to kind of almost forcefully revolt against the ego and say, no, 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 you're going to be humble in this situation, even though it hurts you, even though inside it feels painful sometimes to be humble to somebody who you feel like if your mind is judging and comparing somebody, you feel like they haven't earned your respect, right? If this is the way you've been taught, it might be hurtful. It might feel difficult inside because the mind is protecting that ego. You've got to say, no, 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 you're leaving, buddy. You got to get out of here. You're going to be humble and peaceful whether you like it or not, even when it hurts the most. And that fear of letting go of the ego, you don't really know what it feels like to be humble and peaceful to all beings and being respectful to all beings because you've never been that way before, perhaps. And 
this ego doesn't like it and it wants to hold on. It doesn't want to leave. It wants to enjoy this mind of being arrogant and prideful and having this self. But you've got to kick it out of there and say, no, 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 you're going to get out of here. But it can be fearful because you haven't ever operated this way before. And especially in a place where a lot of people are arrogant and egotistical, you might feel somewhat exposed and kind of naked. And some people say, well, if I let go of the ego and I stop being arrogant, then people are going to try to attack me and they're going to try to take advantage of me if I kind of let down the guard, so to speak, because that's part of what the self and the ego does is it puts up this guard because it's fearful of what other people are going to do to you. And that's part of what the ego and the self does is it, it kind of like holds this guard thinking that it's going to be attacked. And that's because the mind is fearful of being attacked and it doesn't want to let this guard down. Well, if you train your mind really, really well, Michael, and you understand that there's nothing that this person can do to harm you, right? They can say bad words. They can talk bad to you. They can say harmful things, but it's only your own mind that's going to cause any discontentedness. So then you can kind of feel more and more comfortable letting down this guard and eliminating the self, this conceit, what we're calling the ego, you can let this down because you know that no matter what somebody says to you, it doesn't bother the mind. It's only you that's allowing those words to bother you and the mind becomes discontent. A simple way to say this is the way that my grandmother used to say it, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before too. She used to say, sticks and stones can break my bones but words can never hurt me, right? So if you understand that and you practice that, like sure, you can throw sticks and stones and that'll hurt the body. That will cause injury to the body if you throw sticks and stones, but your words will never hurt me. And if you allow the mind to be trained that way where words never hurt you, then the mind can let go of this self can let go of this conceit, essentially let go of this ego, put this guard down because now you don't have to be worried and fearful about what people say and do around you because you know you're the only one that can cause your own discontent mind. You're the only one that can do that. Therefore, you don't need to be fearful of what other people do because only you can cause your mind to be discontent. We have a question from Deborah. David, I have heard that fear can be as a result of experiences in past lives. Is this true? There can be some fears from past lives, and this is related to residual memories. There can be residual memories from past lives, and these residual memories can be deeply rooted in the mind that you're not even aware of. And because of those deeply rooted memories, it can cause fears in this life. And the more that you unwind, I talk about the unenlightened mind being as like a tangled up twine. And as you train the mind, you're kind of like unraveling this ball of twine and kind of untangling it. And as you untangle this, these residual memories can come out or they can even be there without untangling it and causing these fears. But the more you train the mind, you're kind of unraveling this ball of twine, taking out all the little knots until eventually you get to the middle of the ball of the twine and it's empty. There's nothing there. There's nothing left. And that's part of what this training is, is letting go of all those past conditioning, whether it was in this life or a past life. So there's nothing special that you need to do, whether the fear is coming from conditioning from this life or it's coming from conditioning of a past life. The way to address the fear is the same. Because the fear is this craving, desire, attachment, this mind holding on to past conditioning, either from this life or the last life. So the solution and remedy to that is breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity, which we talk about as kind of a general antidote. But then I'm adding in this other piece of eliminating fears, which is to confront your fears and put the mind in the position where it's confronting the thing that it's fearful about and you train it to reside in that situation unfearful. 
So if you're afraid of like swimming, for example, and being in a swimming pool, you've got to train the mind to be unafraid of that. And whether you drowned in a past life and you died in a swimming pool, and now like there's no reason whatsoever that you should be afraid of swimming. But for some reason, you're just afraid of swimming. And there's people that have that as part of this life. And they don't even realize that it's coming from their past life that they drowned in a swimming pool or they drowned in a car accident where they ended up in water. And it doesn't matter whether it's from the past life or this life. The way to fix that is go to a swimming pool, sit on the edge of the pool, put your feet in the pool and just sit there. And kind of like as fear arises in the mind, you just kind of cut it off, you let it go and just kind of keep your feet in the water. And maybe that's all you do on your first visit. Then you go back to the pool again and now you kind of walk into the pool up to your thighs so that you have water up to your thighs. And then fear arises and you kind of cut that off and you calm that down and you train the mind to be okay with that. And then you go back again and now you bring the water up to your hips or your waist or your chest. And you continue to go further and further with this where you kind of increase the amount of stimulus that it's taking that will typically arise the fear. But each time the fear arises, you keep cutting it off and you keep letting it go. This is the way to train the mind to let go of things like being fearful of water or being fearful of the dark or large crowds, or some people are afraid of being alone, right? Spend 10 minutes alone. And then when your your mind gets fear, you try to cut that off, and then you go spend time with some people, or then you spend 30 minutes alone, and then you go back to being around people. Then you spend two hours alone, and you kind of increase the amount of time that the mind will typically be scared, but you start training the mind gradually over time to reside peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in any and all situations to eliminate these various fears. And you may not even be aware of certain fears that you have right now. You might have certain fears that you're aware of and that you can address those in the way that I'm explaining to you in our talk today. But as you unravel this mind and you start addressing some of these fears and you start letting go of some of these craving, desires, attachments in the mind, as you start unraveling the mind, there might be some fears that crop up that you didn't even realize that you had. And as you do and you start noticing those things, if you've already addressed some of these other fears, if there's any other fears that surface as you get going on this path, then you already kind of have a good methodology of how to address these fears because you've already handled it. You've already addressed it with some of these other fears that now when these other fears crop up, you're like, oh yeah, I know how to deal with that because I did that with the dark and I did that with the spiders and I did that with the swimming pool. So now it's just a matter of taking this new fear and putting together kind of a plan, so to speak, of how to address this fear. And that's why, you know, part of what I'm sharing with you guys here is inviting you guys to share some of the fears that you have. If you need help understanding how to put together a plan of how to address these fears, I can help you either here in our class or if you want to contact me privately, I can help you see how to put together a plan to kind of eliminate this fear from the mind. We have a question from Rhonda on the topic of doing no harm and fear. I find that when someone is hostile, I do not meet it, I retreat. However, after the fact, I grow angry and resentful. I tend to avoid that person out of fear of a repeat performance. So while I cause no harm to the world, I do cause harm to myself. How to get over this is my challenge. Okay, good. So let's say you're in a corporate environment, since that was part of your other question before. And you're in a business meeting and and somebody yells at you or or hollers at you, right? And they are not your boss. They're just a coworker, right? Well, by you remaining completely calm and peaceful in that environment, they attack you with hostility. Other people observe what's going on there, that you didn't do anything. They just disagreed with your opinion. And because of that, their disagreement and their attachment, they caused their own discontentedness. And now they've become hostile and angry at you. Okay, you remain calm and peaceful in that situation. But now, as you say, later, the mind becomes fearful of being around that person again. Well, what I would suggest that you do is give it a few days, three days, five days, 10 days, 
but kind of go back around that person and just smile. Just look at them and smile or wave to them or say, hi, how are you doing today? You know, how's your day going? So it doesn't mean that you've necessarily forgotten what happened. You know that they have the potential to be harmful with their speech, but don't allow that situation and that experience to condition your mind that now you're either afraid of that person or some other people in your profession or your career. So the way to uncondition the mind is through this negative experience that it had to then go around that person and just be polite and be kind and smile. And whether that person ever apologizes to you or not, you don't need that. You don't expect that. It may happen. Who knows? But regardless, you have to undo this conditioning of the mind in order to eliminate this fear. And I can give this example with my son. When we were in America, he was about two years old and we were walking down the street and there was this guy coming with a dog and this dog was a puppy it was a pretty big puppy it was like a german shepherd it was like a year and a half year old it was quite big especially for a two-year-old child and this dog just lurched at my son wanting to play with him and you know licking him on the face well my two-year-old son got very very scared and screamed and yelled and you know i picked him up and the dog and the owner kind of he pulled the dog away but this was a pretty traumatic event for my son From that point forward, he was very, very scared of dogs. And by the time he was four or five years old, and we actually moved here to Thailand when he was two and a half, but I noticed by the time he was four or five years old, anytime he was around dogs, he was utterly scared of them and retreated and went in the opposite direction. And I asked him, I said, do you remember what happened to you in America? And he said, no, daddy, I don't. And I said, okay. And I didn't tell him, I didn't remind him. But I just knew that that situation, even though the dog was being playful and had good intentions, it conditioned his mind to be afraid of dogs. So from that point forward, I started taking him around dogs. In fact, we ended up buying a dog, not exclusively because of this, but we ended up buying a dog at one point. And during that time, I noticed that he was afraid of that dog too. So I would teach him how to politely pet the dog and that if you didn't cause any harm to the dog the dog won't cause any harm to you and i taught him how to play with the dog and slowly over many months he eliminated this fear but if he would have completely retreated like what you're talking about from a human being and not going around that person then you allow the mind to hold on to that conditioning and that negative experience and it won't let it go so the way that you let it go is you actually confront it So if you experience a hostile negative situation from someone, then we might say in English or in Western culture that you be the bigger person, you be the better person and give it three days, five days, 10 days, but go around that person and smile and ask them, how are you doing today? Nice to see you. Hope everything's well for you. Talk to them every once in a while. It doesn't mean that you agree with their intentions you don't agree with their speech and the decisions that they made in that business meeting that they were hostile towards you but there's no reason for you to hold on to that past experience and allow that conditioning to affect the mind and be fearful this is what i mean by confronting the fear is it possible david to do harm purely with intentions even if it doesn't follow through into our speech and actions the other way that we talk about right intention is right thinking or right thought. So what intentions are that second step on the Eightfold Path is it's the mind, the thinking of the mind, the intention of the mind. So you can have certain intentions, but never act upon them with speech and actions that are harmful to you. So if you have thinking that comes to mind that is destructive thinking or destructive intentions, but they're never acted upon, they can still be destructive and harmful for your own mind. So this is why the Buddha separated these out where you've got right view, right intention, right speech, right action, and all the way through the whole Eightfold Path because these are individual things that need to be purified. The harms that we cause in each one of these categories of the Eightfold Path and this training that the Eightfold Path lays out for us is a complete path 
to purification of the mind and training the mind to reside in the world, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. So you can actually have negative, harmful, destructive thoughts that only ever are in your mind, but they're destructive for you. And that's why part of this training of this path is to purify those so they don't become destructive and hurtful. Let me give an example. Let's say you had a situation, and I'm going to use something that's a little bit not really controversial, but something that I would like to see improved in the world. Several hundreds of years ago, you know, and even it's continuing today, there's people whose minds have been conditioned to be fearful or hateful towards people of other races. So if you've got one color of skin and another person has another color of skin or from another ethnic descent, people were taught to be hateful of each other, okay? And this has been passed down from person to person to person to the point where here we are today in the year 2020 and we still have people in the world that are racist, that are discriminatory, that are hurtful and hateful towards another person for no other reason other than the fact that they look different than they do, right? And of course, we disagree with this. We disagree with this, but that's their practice and that's their conditioning of the mind. And we feel loving kindness and compassion for this person who's being racist or discriminatory because they don't have the wisdom to see that they're actually causing themselves a lot of problems in the world. And they don't have the wisdom to control their mind, to look at all beings in a loving, kind, compassionate way. So that to me is something that is a fear that is being generated in the mind based on conditioning that either they were taught growing up or maybe they had an experience. Let's just say this person was a African-American person who was, let's say they were robbed and beaten up and nearly murdered by someone of the opposite race. Now, if this person who's African-American, if they now start hating all people of an opposite race because of that experience, now this fear is based on conditioning from their thinking. So now when they walk down the street, if they see someone of the opposite race, they might be fearful and inside feel negative towards this person. And it's causing them problems in their life because now they can't feel comfortable being around someone who is of the opposite race. This scenario that I'm depicting, it goes in multiple directions. It can be, you know, people of Caucasian descent hating African-Americans and being fearful of them. It can be African-Americans being hateful or fearful of people of Caucasian descent. It can be, you know, Chinese people being fearful of Indian people and Indian people being fearful of Russian people. We take these labels of Russian and Chinese and Indian and American and we start assigning people these labels and categories. And if there's a negative experience that someone has with a particular person of this particular category, the mind will oftentimes associate that experience with all people from this particular category. And this is where racism and discrimination comes from, is people take these labels and then they assign certain thinking or certain negative experiences to the entire group of people rather than realizing that was just one person, that was just one experience. It doesn't mean every single person of that particular type is that way. And this is where in the book, I don't talk about it extensively, but I do mention it about how we need to eliminate all labels, all categorizations, you know, black, white, you know, Chinese, Indian, uh, Russian, you, you name it, you know, gay, straight, bisexual, you know, all these different labels that human race and humankind wants to assign to various people. And this is part of that self, that self-identity. People start adopting these labels and they start identifying with these labels and it becomes part of the self. But what we need to get to in this world is where we eliminate these categorizations. We eliminate these labels, not only in our own life, 
to eliminate this self and eradicate this self, but we need to stop assigning these to other people as well and then thinking that everybody's going to be exactly the same way. So if you've had a negative experience with a certain person or a certain type of person, let's just even take the whole race thing out of it. Let's just say that you went in as a child and you had a nurse that jabbed you with a needle and caused you know dire pain, inflicted pain with this needle in getting a vaccine. And now every time you're around a nurse who's dressed in nurse clothing, whether it's a male or female, dressed in nurse clothing, the mind becomes fearful of a nurse. Or we have people that are fearful of doctors, right? Or fearful of the dentist, thinking that all dentists are going to cause and inflict pain, or all doctors are going to inflict pain, or all nurses are going to inflict pain because of that one experience where the nurse was maybe having a bad day, where they maybe didn't take their time, maybe they weren't as compassionate as they could be, and they just grabbed you and jabbed you in the arm and shot you with that vaccine. Well, if you hold on to that conditioning and that negative experience, now every time you're around somebody with those same clothing or those same credentials, the mind's going to be fearful. And this is where the mind can't be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because it's holding on. That craving, desire, attachment, the mind is holding on to this negative conditioning and now you're actually harming yourself through your thinking, which was Max's question. Through your thinking, through your own destructive thoughts, whenever you go into a hospital, the heart starts beating really fast and rapidly. Your hands start sweating. You start getting the stress and anxiety and you may not even realize why because it might have happened so early in your life. And that's why you've got to let go of these fears because you need to exist in the world, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. And these labels that we assign people, whether it's a nurse, doctor, dentist, whether it's because of a certain race or ethnicity or a certain sexual orientation, you can have either one bad experience or you can hear from other people that they had a bad experience with somebody of one of these categories. And if you allow the mind to hold on to that and think negatively about these groups of people and you label people in your mind, then you're going to assign those same attributes, that same conditioning of your mind is going to assign it to this person who you just met and who could be one of the most loving, kind, compassionate people you ever met. But because of this conditioning that the mind's holding on to, you're allowing that to cause fear. And now you're not able to see true reality. You're not able to see the true reality that that was just one situation that happened. And now there's no reason for you to assign that same negative conditioning that you're holding onto in the mind to this other person. And if you do, then you're limiting your ability to be open, loving, and kind with all people in the world. And this is going to inhibit you from having open relationships with all people. And this is how fear becomes destructive to the mind. And what it really is, is it's just a symptom of the same primary problem that Gautama Buddha discovered, which is craving desire attachment the mind's holding on and the more it holds on the more discontent the mind's going to be and that's why we have to train the mind to let go of these past experiences and conditionings from the past and reside in the present moment and don't hold on to this conditioning so that the mind can be peaceful calm serene and content with joy as long as it holds on to this past conditioning then there's the potential for it to become fearful based on this judgment and these labels that we assign people in the world. You've got to get to the point where you look at another human being and all you see is another human being. That's it. That you just see another human being and that's it. That you don't see the color of their skin. You don't see their hair. You don't see their tattoos. You don't see their clothing. Sure, it's there but you don't assign negative meaning and negative experiences to it. If you've been taught everybody with tattoos is a horrible convict 
or a criminal and you see somebody walking down the street with all kinds of tattoos on their body, your mind's going to be fearful because of the conditioning that you think and you believe that everyone with tattoos, for example, is a criminal and they're going to murder you. So you've got to let go of all that. And when you look at another human being, no matter what you see, just see a human being. And when you let go of all that categorization and all those labels, essentially what you're doing is letting go of the conditioning that some people have in the mind that they're holding on to. So if there's anything with another human being that you feel like all these type of people are bad and all these type of people are good, that's conditioning and it's going to lead to fear. And you've got to let that go. Okay, we have a question that's come in anonymously. The question is about fear of driving on a bridge. This person is scared that they might fall off the bridge or if the bridge might break down. How to overcome fear of driving on the bridge. Thank you. Yeah, so you've got to train the mind to reside on the bridge, peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. If the ultimate fear is being in a car, driving on a bridge, then we don't want to go there probably just yet. So what would probably be good for you is to drive a car or a bike or whatever it is, get to an actual bridge, get out and walk across the bridge. And as long as the mind feels comfortable doing that, slowly train the mind to be on the bridge, looking over the side, looking at the structure and spending time on this bridge and just walking and being fine on the bridge and doing that multiple multiple times essentially what you're doing is desensitizing the mind to associating being on a bridge in this negative hurtful experience that the mind thinks is going to happen associating it with a positive experience so go out on the bridge take photos look at the sun look at the scenery eat a sandwich if you want right go out on the bridge spend multiple times and visit that until the mind is like, hmm, no big deal. This is fine. Then now do it maybe with a bicycle if you're able to. Or if you need to do it in a car, do it in a car. Have somebody else drive. Because if you're fearful of driving, maybe it's better for you to be in the passenger side. Because if your mind becomes too fearful, then maybe you can't drive across the bridge, but you could be a passenger in a car going across the bridge multiple times right? Do that multiple times, multiple times, multiple times, and then eventually build up to the point where you're able to drive the car across the bridge. And all of these multiple visits to the bridge is desensitizing the mind to this situation where the mind becomes fearful on the bridge. And maybe you do all of that on one particular bridge. And now you've got to go to a second bridge and now repeat the same process if you need to, if you feel like you need to, or a third or a fourth, until eventually the mind just lets go and it realizes there's no problem here. These bridges are just fine. The problem is in my mind, that my mind is holding on to this fear. So the way to undo this conditioning, the way to rewire this in the mind is to have multiple experiences where you're on a bridge and nothing bad happens and you can see the mind that it can remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy and it has positive experiences on the bridge. That's the way to let go of this conditioning. The way that you get rid of these negative thoughts in the mind about a certain situation and experience is you replace it with positive experiences. So for whatever reason that the mind's holding on to this thought that there's going to be something bad happening to you on a bridge is you've got to create enough positive experiences and frequently enough that it replaces those negative experiences, right? And that's kind of like what I suggested to Rhonda, whereas if a colleague talks harshly to you and aggressive to you in a business meeting, for example, you've got to replace that with multiple hello how are you good morning nice to see you multiple times so you're replacing that negative experience with these positive experiences just like i did with my son when he had this negative experience with the dog instead of him associating every single dog with 
you know, jumping up on him and licking him, in his mind, probably thought that this dog was attacking him. We replaced those, that negative situation that he had at two years old with all these positive experiences with dogs. So you can do the same thing with the bridge, for example, is create all these positive experiences with being on a bridge, whether it's walking, riding a bike, being a passenger in a car, or driving the car yourself. And that's how you eliminate this fear. We have a comment from Chital. My fear is making uncomfortable, difficult conversations with family and sometimes friends. She also follows up and says, uh, more specifically, fears of uncertainty and rejection, also fear of failure. Okay, so this is the mind craving a certain outcome, Chatel. The mind wants a certain outcome. And you and I have had you know, a good amount of private conversations, so I'm familiar with your experiences and what you've encountered. So whatever the mind holds as an expectation in these conversations with your family members, if you hold that expectation and you want that outcome of this loving, kind relationship and you want this gentle, warm speech, of course, everybody would like to have family members that are like that. That's a great goal or interest to have. But you've got to realize that the family members that you have around you aren't that way. And there's nothing you can do to change them. They have to choose to change on their own. But as long as you have the expectation and you want the outcome to be different, that's where the mind's going to be discontent and fearful. So you've got to recognize that as long as you want something different than what you're getting, the mind's going to be discontent. So you've got to no longer attach your peacefulness, your contentedness, and your joy based on what this other person says. Because as long as you allow the words of another person to affect your mind, you're essentially giving them power over you because of your craving, desire, attachment. You're causing it yourself. You're causing the painful feelings in the mind because the mind is expecting and wanting this person to be loving, to be caring, to be gentle, to be friendly. And because you want that so badly, that's why you're causing the mind to be discontent. And you've got to recognize this person may not ever be that way in your life whatsoever. But as long as you allow your mind to be attached to that and craving that outcome, that means you're essentially giving up your power and you're no longer able to control your own mind because you want this from the other person. Where when we talk about enlightenment and we talk about liberation of the mind, the way that you liberate the mind from this situation is hey, if they're negative and they're hostile and they're aggressive, that's on them. I'm not going to allow it to affect my mind. If they're generous and gentle and loving and kind, that's fine. I'm not going to let it affect my mind and expect that they're going to do that every single time. But if your mind is attached to the outcome of these conversations, then your mind isn't liberated. It's attached. You've got to let go of this expectation of this outcome from these conversations with your family members. And that's where the real liberation comes in, that you no longer are allowing your mind to be shaken up by what these other people say or do. And that's real liberation where now you aren't susceptible to their attacks or their negativity or their hostility. That's why we call it liberation of the mind, because you're liberated from these type of things. We have a question from Javier. I wouldn't risk jumping from a plane out of fear of a fatal accident. Does it mean I should go and jump from a plane? I don't think you mean that, right? So for me, I've always been afraid of heights as well. And it's something that was always in my mind. So what I did is I went around here in Thailand. They have malls that are like seven, eight stories tall. And I went around and, you know, kind of went to the highest floor and kept looking over and looking over. And I did that multiple times. Also here in Thailand, they have rooftop restaurants that are on like the 50th floor of a building. And they have like glass 
that you can basically look over and you're like, it looks like you're about to fall. So I did that multiple, multiple times and it helped me to get over the fear of heights. I'm not interested in going and jumping out of a plane. It's not something that would be beneficial to me. But if I had to do it, if it was required for me to do it, I could do it. I wouldn't allow the mind to be fearful of jumping out of a plane. But it's not something that I need to do as part of my life as a Buddhist teacher. If I was in some other career, then sure, I would need to do that. But I don't ever anticipate ever needing that skill or ability. But the real problem that was in the mind was a fear of heights. So identifying that, you can do other things besides jumping out of an airplane to eliminate the fear of heights. And some of the ones that I just suggested to you might be something that you're able to do as well. David, what would be a Buddhist perspective on risk taking? Because everything we do in life is really some kind of risk. You know, we might buy a house and the market might crash the next month, or we might go to the shops in our car, but these things aren't inherently unwholesome. And yet sometimes even with well-intentioned thought out decisions, they can still produce unwholesome outcomes potentially. So where do we draw the middle way there? That's a personal decision, you know, like connecting what you're asking back to what Javier was just asking. On Saturday, yesterday for Father's Day, we went to a place that has go-karts and ATVs and paintball and they even have bungee jumping there, right? Where you jump out of, of bungee. And when we were waiting for our food, we went and watched the bungee jumpers and my wife, my my son and I were sitting there watching them. And as I was watching them, I looked at my wife, and I was like, I would never do anything like this, right? It's not because I'm fearful of doing it. It's like, there's no benefit in it. Like, why would I go all the way up there, like super high, tie myself to a bunch of rubber bands and jump off of a platform? And I said to her, as I said, you know, I think one of the things that makes this thrilling for people is that in the mind, the mind knows that there's the potential of death and people are kind of looking for those pleasant feelings and it comes from the potential of death. So, you know, all of these teachings of the Buddha are based on this wise decision-making, this discernment. And I'm not judging the people who are bungee jumping because, you know, who knows, maybe that's what they're choosing to do to overcome their fear and anxiety of heights or something. So I'm not judging those people. If other people are interested in bungee jumping, you know, go for it. You know, not looking down or not looking up to those people either way. I was just commenting to my wife, you know, connected to Max's question. That's a risk that I wouldn't ever be interested to take because there's no benefit for it because I'm not looking to create any pleasant feelings by jumping off and doing a bungee jump. There's nothing in that whole experience that is going to benefit my life, right? There's no benefit for me to choose to do something like that. But if other people choose to do it, that's their choice. And there's no judgment on anyone who chooses to do that. But you've got to look at things and decide, you know, what in this life is beneficial for you and what would you be willing to take so it's not that everybody needs to eliminate the fear of bungee jumping and everyone needs to go out and bungee jumping because the fear that some people might have in bungee jumping is not the fear of bungee jumping they're afraid of heights which i used to be afraid of heights so i addressed that fear but that doesn't mean i need to go bungee jumping or i need to go jump out of an airplane in order to do it. There's other ways to address the core problem. And this is one of the things that the Buddhist teachings brings to your mind is you've got to get to the root, right? If somebody says, I'm afraid of skydiving or I'm afraid of bungee jumping, well, they're not really afraid of those two things. The root is they're afraid of heights. So in order to get to the core of the mind and get to that empty mind where you eliminate craving, desire, attachment, and a lot of these fears is you've got to go back to the root and you've got to trace back what the real root is. And in certain situations, you might not be interested to risk your life or you might not be interested in risking money or risking the life of your family members for a potential outcome. So something like bungee jumping, the outcome is, okay, you can either die or you can get some pleasant feelings 
along the way for like 30 seconds or however many minutes afterwards that you might have pleasant feelings. Well, that is like, okay, die or get pleasant feelings. Well, if you really are interested in pleasant feelings, there's probably other ways to gain pleasant feelings in this world besides bungee jumping. But if somebody wants to go bungee jumping, that's their life and that's what they enjoy doing and they go do it. So there's no judgment in someone who chooses a bungee jumping, but just for my decision making at this point in my life, I have no need to bungee jump because the risk there is potential death and I'm not interested in creating pleasant feelings in the mind. So there's no reason for me to do something like that. But in terms of other risk, you just have to apply wise decision making and what you feel is best for your life. So while we're not attached to a certain outcome, wanting and craving, desiring, having this longing and strong eagerness for a particular outcome, we are pursuing goals, objectives and interest for a potential outcome. So since I know Max is into Bitcoin and into investments, you have a certain outcome that you would like with your investments, which are increased income, and that helps you to live your life. And there's a certain risk associated with that. So there's nothing wrong with applying wise decision making to make an investment and work towards a certain outcome, which is increased income. Where the problem comes in is if somebody's mind obsesses about it where if the mind wants, craves, desires, has this longing, strong eagerness for a particular amount of money in a particular time frame, then the mind can become neurotic and it can be checking the markets regularly. You know, when you lose money, then you're immediately trying to react to that and hurry up and invest more money to recoup that money. The mind can go into these neurotic cycles where it only feels content or peaceful when it feels like there's some certain gain rather than kind of approaching it logically with wise decision making and gradually working towards a certain outcome. If the mind has this longing and strong eagerness for an outcome, it's going to be discontent when it doesn't get that outcome. But someone who's taking risk and in investing, for example, and they know they're working towards an outcome, but they're not always going to achieve that outcome all the time, then when they fall short of that outcome, then they can step back, logically look at this, use some wisdom, and then make some improved decisions to potentially get to certain outcome that they would like to achieve. But as long as the mind is holding on and expecting a certain outcome, that's where the real problem comes in. And the risk that you choose to take as part of your life is all going to be based on your own unique individual variables in your life. And this is one of the other reasons why you can't judge another person's life is because you don't know all the different variables in that person's life. So like yesterday when we went and we saw these people bungee jumping, if I was sitting there judgmental of these people, then, you know, who am I to judge their life? You know, that's their choice. That's what they chose to do. They have certain reasons why they feel that that is important for them to do. And I don't know all those variables. Why would I have any interest in judging this other person for what they choose to do in the world and what risk they choose to take? So we've got to get to a point where we make wise decisions in our life And we're looking at the variables in our life and making wise decisions in our life. And what other people choose to do with their intention, speech, and actions, that's their choice. And you don't allow them to affect your mind. That's great. Thank you, David. So we make decisions knowing that we don't necessarily control the outcome and that we can be prepared for any outcome mentally. But the problems arise when we attach to a specific outcome. We crave a certain result. Exactly. That's a great way to summarize it is, you know, just don't expect any certain outcome and just know that there's all different kinds of options. That's the beauty about letting go of expectations. You know, back to Neil's question about letting go of the ego, letting go of some of these things. When the mind holds on to a five year plan or a 10 year plan or whatever, and it has a certain expectation, there's no way that you can actually meet that. 
you know, no matter how good you do your planning, you know, there's going to be impermanence over the next five years and you're not going to meet your plan, right? Where if you allow those expectations to root in the mind, you're essentially sabotaging yourself that you're going to be discontent because you're expecting some sort of outcome. One of the beauties about letting all this stuff go, letting craving, desire, attachment go, and not having expectations and outcomes is everything is wonderful. This is why the mind's so joyful is because everything's wonderful because you have no expectation. So when I woke up yesterday, I forgot that it was even Father's Day. But had I remembered that it was Father's Day, I had no expectation of what the day was going to be like. I just woke up. And then as we were going through our day, I noticed my wife and my son went out to the garden. They clipped a bunch of flowers. They were sitting at the table, stringing some flowers together. And I was like, in my mind, I, was like, hmm, I wonder what they're doing. That's kind of different. Like they don't usually do that. And they were just putting the flowers together. And I was just kind of walked over there. I was like, wow, that's so beautiful. That's so nice what you guys are doing. You're like, I was just kind of complimenting them like, wow, this is such a great activity that you guys are choosing to do today. And then I went back to the sofa and I was kind of like doing stuff on the computer, probably replying to some of y'all's questions in the Facebook group. And I happened to look at the calendar and I was like, oh, it's Father's Day. And then I was like, that's why you guys are doing that. It's Father's Day, right? And they just kind of smiled and they didn't say anything. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so sweet of you guys. Because they could have easily went down to the store and bought flowers or had some kind of arrangement made for them. But they chose to go out on the garden, clip the flowers, spend time together, stringing this together. And I was like, wow, that's so nice of you guys. And then my son got this bowl of water together, put some flowers on it. They got, had a little gift for me and they asked me to sit down and my son washed my feet and poured this water with the flowers over my hands, which is kind of a customary thing to do in Thailand. I had no expectation that that was going to occur whatsoever even when i realized that it was father's day i had no expectation of any of that stuff but when it did occur and he did do it it was like wow this is so wonderful because i had no expectation of what he should or shouldn't be doing on father's day and then after that i was like hey guys would you like to do something today like go out and kind of do something and we all kind of agreed that yeah let's go outside and do something so our plan was after thinking about it as a family and looking online was to go bowling. And we went to a mall that we typically don't go to that has a bowling alley. And we showed up there at 12 o'clock because the advertisement said that the bowling alley opens at 11. And when we got there at 12, the bowling alley was completely dark and all the employees were there kind of sitting in the back. And when they came, you know, we were all interested to bowl and when they came, they were like, oh, we're not opening until 1230 today because the technician hasn't come in to open up the equipment and cycle the balls through. And we don't know if the equipment's working. He has to test it first before we can open. And we kind of looked at each other and like we looked around and we were like, you know, I'm not really sure if we would like to wait until 1230. And it seemed like the place wasn't really vibrant and it wasn't maybe something that was going to be interesting. And then we asked them, do you have the bumpers to the guardrails for the gutters? Because my son's only eight years old. And I thought like, if they don't have the bumpers, it's not going to be fun for him anyway, because all of his balls are going to be gutter balls. So they said, no, we don't have the bumpers here. So we kind of talked and we're like, all right, well, let's not go bowling. Whereas if we were expecting to go bowling and we wanted to go bowling and we were craving to go bowling and then we got there and they weren't open, our mind would have been discontent because we were craving it so much. So then from that point, we we're like, OK, well, let's just go to the movie theater at the mall and we'll just watch a movie together. So we walked over to the movie theater and we started looking at all the movies and they didn't have any movies that were in English at this particular movie theater. They were all in Thai language and they didn't really have any movies at our particular time. So we decided, OK, well, we're not going to watch movies at this movie theater. Let's go to another movie theater. And we kind of looked on the mobile device and we kind of found a movie in a time at a different mall. And we're like, OK, let's all go in the car and we'll go over to that mall and we'll eat. We'll go to the arcade and then the movie will start in about two hours and we'll go to that movie. So we get in the car and we're headed towards the mall 
And then while we're going, my son and I looked at the trailer for the movie we were planning to watch because we just saw it, the title at the other movie theater. And when we saw the trailer, I was like, "Mm, that movie doesn't look so good. I'm not sure that I would be interested in watching that. And my son said, yeah, they kind of use bad language anyway. Maybe we shouldn't see that movie. But it was kind of like a kid's movie, even though they used a little bit of bad language. And he was kind of interested to go see it. And I was like, nah, let's not go see that. Why don't we go to the go-kart track and we'll go like play go-karts? Well, I'm telling you this story because there was all this change, right? And nowhere along the line did I, my wife or my son, although my son had a little bit of craving for the cartoon movie, he got a little bit discontent, a little bit grumpy. But my wife and I, we weren't attached to any particular thing or any particular outcome. And because of that, we were able to ebb and flow throughout our day. And we ultimately landed at this facility where they had ATVs, they had go-karts, paintballing, bungee jumping, food, and all this other stuff. And we had a really joyful experience because we just resided in the present moment. We just did whatever came up and whatever came to the mind. And we weren't attached to all those other things like the bowling alley or the movie theater or the arcade or any of that other stuff. We just kind of moved with it and never allowed the mind to hold on to any one particular thing. And that's why the mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, because you don't allow the mind to latch on and you just kind of ebb and flow with whatever needs to happen in the present moment. Nice. Sounds like Bailan did a great job there to maintain his contentedness. He got grumpy for just a little bit when I, when I said, oh, we're not going to go see the movie. He kind of looked out the window and kind of like did one of these things for about 30 <laughs> seconds. And then I said, uh, oh, Bailan, you're attached to the movie, aren't you? I was like, ah, oh, you got discontentedness. No, daddy, I don't have discontentedness. I don't have discontentedness. And I was like, oh, so that's the ego. The ego wants to think that you don't have discontentedness. But look how grumpy you are. You're kind of looking out the window and you're kind of grumpy. I'm like, that's the ego. And he's like, no, I don't have ego. And I was like, that's the ego speaking. <laughs> so we kind of joke and play sometimes about these teachings. And it's kind of like a way to take a lighter approach to this where you don't feel like you're so wrong because you have ego or you don't feel so bad because you got discontentedness. We kind of joke about it in our family sometimes when I see my son or my wife have discontentedness. I will joke them a lot of times um, when they get discontent. And sometimes they get more discontent the more I joke them, but that helps them get rid of the self when I do that. But other times when they get a little bit discontent and I joke them, they'll start laughing too and they'll let go of the attachment and their mind will immediately become content because they realize how silly they're being to allow their mind to become discontent. So this is one of the ways that you can kind of lighten the mood around the house and all the different members of the family can support and encourage each other on this path. Because oftentimes when your mind's discontent and there's certain attachments there, you don't always see it for yourself. So I'm frequently helping my son or my wife see what their attachments are. Like on Saturday morning, I went into my wife's room because we sleep in separate rooms and she was getting ready to meditate. And I was kind of like, laying on the bed next to her like joking her and starting to tickle her and she was like ah just get away i want to meditate like stop tickling me she was like getting a little discontent so i started tickling her more and i was like yeah look see you're attached to meditation you can't reside in the present moment and just enjoy this present moment that we're having of me tickling you so eventually she let it go And she realized that she was attached to meditation a little bit and she was getting a little bit discontent because I wouldn't leave her room in order to meditate. And I was like, why don't you just reside in the present moment and just enjoy this moment that we're having? I was like, it's not permanent. I'm not going to be tickling you permanently. So this is one of the ways to kind of skillfully help somebody see their discontentedness and see their attachments and what they're actually attached to. And it can be kind of fun to support and encourage each other along the path. It's nice. Thank you, David. So we have a question from Amina. Hello, everyone. David, I have a question for my young daughter. She is afraid of hurting the feelings of others and at times will agree to things that she would rather not. How can she approach this fear and overcome it? 
okay, the best way to do that for your daughter is ensure that she understands the five factors of well-spoken speech. Because if the fear is that she might say something that's going to be harmful and hurt someone's feelings, then the more she understands and practices the five factors of well-spoken speech, she won't be causing any harm to anybody. And she can see that through her speech. So she just needs to learn those five factors really, really well and practice them better and better and better. And then as she's practicing those five factors in multiple conversations over long periods of time, she can slowly realize that she's not causing any harm. There's no way for her to cause harm. So therefore, there's no reason for her to be fearful in those situations. We have a question from Guyen. Hi, David. I'm scared of the dark, especially at night. I rarely stay home alone at night. At that time, I usually turn on all lights in the house, even the restroom's lights. And I turn on the TV overnight to overcome this fear. Please advise. Thank you. Yeah, so you've got to slowly start stripping this stuff away. So if you normally turn on all the lights and the TVs, you've got to turn on just maybe the lights. Leave the TVs off and do that for a few days or a week. Then turn on just two or three lights and turn off all the others and slowly get comfortable with just two or three lights on. Then get to the point where it's just one light on and you feel comfortable with that over multiple weeks. Then get to the point where you're comfortable turning off that one light for 10 seconds and then you turn it back on or turn it off for a minute or two and then turn it back on and slowly, gradually expand the amount of time that you can reside without the light. But you need to do this gradually because the mind doesn't like impermanence. So if you just completely turn off everything and went into your house, oh, the mind's going to be so neurotic and fearful. So that's why you got to slowly taper it down like this. It's almost like tapering away like cigarettes. If you were smoking cigarettes or you were addicted to sodas or coffee or something like this, you've got to slowly kind of taper the mind away gradually easing it away and gradually training it to be comfortable in the dark. We have a question from Deborah. Being nervous of public speaking, is it fear or ego? Fear is essentially from craving desire attachment. Anytime the mind's discontent, if you remember when I talk about a discontent mind, painful feelings, pleasant feelings, feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant, When I talk about painful feelings, I always talk about sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, and fear, right? This is part of the painful feelings, part of that discontent mind, and all discontentedness is caused by craving, desire, attachment. That's the general way to explain it. But then going deeper, there's these 10 fetters, which are producing the unwholesome results in the mind. So whether the fear is being produced by the ego or the self or all these other things, it's interesting to kind of explore that. But what it really all comes back to is this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness is that's what's producing the fear in the mind. So by applying breathing, mindfulness, meditation, practicing generosity, and then confronting these fears, then you will be able to eliminate them. And this kind of methodology that I'm sharing, like I just shared with the last student about gradually easing the mind to be comfortable in the dark or gradually moving the mind away from a craving like coffee or cigarettes or something like that. Once you do this with one, two, three fears or one, two, three craving, desire, attachments, you can then replicate this. And I think Matt can probably speak to this because he's done this with a lot of different attachments in his life, where once you do it the first, second, third time, you start building this kind of confidence that anytime you observe discontentedness in the mind as that red light on the dashboard that we've talked about, you can then track it back and identify what the craving desire attachments are. Then you can put a plan in place You've already got the breathing, mindfulness, meditation, and generosity going all the time, but now you can put a specific plan in place to specifically address this one particular craving, desire, attachment that you're working on. And when you get successful at one, two, three of these, 
it almost becomes fun and it almost becomes interesting to see what's the next craving desire attachment that pops up in the mind. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt where you find one. It's like, aha, now I got something to work on. And now you put together and you devise this plan to kind of slowly chip away at this. And as you do and you gain some success and you start seeing how you eliminate these various craving desires attachments and the mind becomes more peaceful because of that work that you did, you start building this confidence that anytime discontentedness comes to the mind, you don't have to immediately reject it. You can just observe it for what it is. Ah, discontentedness. There's got to be some craving desire attachment there. What is it? Oh, it's this. Okay, well, I've already eliminated these other craving desire attachments using this methodology of gradually easing the mind away from it. It's just a matter of devising a plan to do that with these new craving desire attachments that I'm observing now. So let me implement this plan and start to chip away at it slowly over time. And if you need help putting together the plan on any particular craving desire attachment, that's where your teacher comes in and you can seek guidance with me to help you. But what I'm sharing here is that the more you do this, the more success you have with it, and you see the results that the mind does become more peaceful, more calm, serene, content with joy, then it's just a matter of replicating that same methodology with this new craving desire attachment. We have a question from Shisao. How should people with OCD deal with fear? It's the same way. OCD is essentially the mind has this compulsion, right? There's like this repetitive thoughts in the mind. Typically, there's different aspects of that. It's not a true illness. It's a challenge that that person's experiencing. It's symptoms that they're having, but it's not a biological based mental illness that's permanent the way that some people think in the world. OCD or this repetitive thoughts in the mind can be remedied through active training of the mind through these good wholesome teachings. So a person that has repetitive thoughts or has depression or has suicidal thoughts or has what we may call schizophrenia where there's voices and things that they're hearing or personality disorders, all of these things that we now classify as mental illness, there's nothing different about their mind versus somebody else's mind. That's why the Buddhist teachings are timeless and they apply to all people. Because the Buddha discovered these teachings 2,500 years ago, and there's been so much impermanence in the teaching since then, and nowadays we don't understand the human mind as well as they did during the Buddha's lifetime, we've now gotten to a point where certain discontentedness we label as an illness or a mental illness, but it doesn't matter how much medicine someone takes, it never seems to really get better. Oftentimes it even gets worse. So the more that we understand these good, wholesome teachings of the Buddha and we implement this training of the mind, what you realize is these things that we're calling today mental illnesses are actually just symptoms of someone who's not practicing these teachings, someone who's unenlightened. So someone who's unenlightened and not on this path, they're going to experience sadness, which we might call depression, or they might experience mania, which we might call excitement or, you know, excited feelings. They might experience repetitive thoughts, which people call OCD, which is essentially just the mind having craving desire attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness to keep doing the same thing over and over again. That's the obsessive compulsive aspect of OCD. The mind has craving desire attachment this mental longing with a strong eagerness to keep doing the same thing over and over or keep thinking the same thing over and over. The mind's holding on. And because the mind's holding on with this problem, this unwholesome root of craving desire attachment, that can be remedied through the Buddhist teachings. It doesn't matter how many pills that someone takes, that's not going to fix that the mind is untrained and unenlightened. So the more that we train the mind in these good, wholesome teachings, you're going to see that all these 
mental illnesses are going to fall away. And the more people in the world who discover these teachings, you're going to start seeing that mental illness is going to start falling away. There's a ton of students that have been studying with me that on their own have eliminated their bipolar medication, their depression medication, their sleep medication. There's people that are studying these teachings with me through these um, resources that I share that have gotten off of their medicine. And I'm one of those people. That's how I know that this is the truth is because I used to be on a lot of medications and I got rid of all that stuff. I used to not even be able to fall asleep without taking a bunch of medicine. And today you see, I fell asleep <laughs> just closing my eyes for a few minutes and I dozed off, which that was not possible several years ago. Like my mind just wasn't in a place where it was calm enough to naturally fall asleep. And I didn't really believe it 100%, but there was a certain level of belief that I was ill and I was sick. And I was convinced by this person that was in a position of authority that I needed to take these medicines for the rest of my life. And I kind of relegated myself to that until I realized it wasn't working over 24 years. And then slowly as I started implementing these teachings and then decreasing the medications, I realized that I wasn't sick at all. I was unwell. The mind was unwell. The mind wasn't performing well, but it wasn't something that medicine was going to fix. It was something that I needed to train the mind in these good, wholesome teachings. And when I did, that's when I was able to get off all these medications. And now it's so wonderful to be able to fall asleep naturally without any medications. And I don't have to take medications during the day and I don't experience any of those side effects that I used to encounter because of all those different medications. So a person that has been labeled as OCD or bipolar or depressed or suicidal or any of these other things, they can learn and practice these teachings and ease the mind into being unshakable and closer and closer to enlightenment. And they can ultimately eliminate these medications from their life and live a very good, wholesome life when they've got these teachings as a foundation in which to operate their life in. Okay, we have one more question. This one came from uh, an anonymous person. How to get rid of attachment of everything? Because we always think there is an ego, like I. How to get rid of illusions in our daily life? It's all a comprehensive approach. I often get these kind of questions where someone will say, you know, how do I eliminate fear? How do I eliminate depression? How do I eliminate sadness, anxiety, stress, all of these different things? There's a complete comprehensive path here. The way that we've been taught in modern society is that for each individual problem, there's an individual pill or medication to take. If you're sad, take this pill. If you have fear, take this pill. If you've got stress, take this pill. And there's like these individual pills for every individual symptom. But what you learn through these teachings is you really only have 10 specific problems, which are the 10 fetters. Those are the 10 problems, the very detailed problems of the mind, which then bubble up to these three poisons or three unwholesome roots or three fires, right? Craving, anger, and ignorance or unknowing of true reality or greed, hatred, and delusion. That's kind of like the bubbled up high level way to refer to these 10 individual problems in the mind, the 10 fetters. That's the real problem that we have in the human mind. And the Buddha provides antidotes or a prescription to remedy each individual problem in the mind. And what you're going to learn through this whole comprehensive path is how to address all of these throughout this journey in building this life practice. So to be able to give a specific thing of saying, well, how do you eliminate the ego? Or how do you eliminate this one little thing, the self? You've got to look at this as an entire approach, an entire life practice, where you're comprehensively starting from the beginning and building up this life practice. Because while there's these 10 individual problems and there's kind of antidotes for all of these different things, there really needs to be a baseline foundation 
in which to build on in order to get to those. So those 10 fetters, those 10 problems, you wouldn't be able to just kind of go in and specifically eliminate each one of those 10 fetters. You have to first start at the beginning, which is understanding the three universal truths. You then have to understand the four noble truths. You then need to start practicing the eightfold path, which includes meditation and training the mind in that daily. Then you need to, with that practice, get deeper and deeper into meditation and experiencing these jhanas. Then you need to start focusing on these 10 fetters and moving through the four stages of enlightenment. So to be able to kind of talk about the end result and the final outcome of eliminating these 10 fetters, you can't really do that until you actually start at the beginning, which is building the foundation of this life practice in a comprehensive way where you first start with the three universal truths, the four noble truths and so on. So essentially what you're doing is you're building this foundation, you're building all this wisdom of these teachings just to get to the point where you have the opportunity to address these 10 major problems in the mind, which are the 10 fetters. But you wouldn't ever be able to get to those realizations of eliminating the self, for example, or dissolving the ego, for example. You wouldn't ever be able to get to those if you hadn't first laid down the groundwork and the foundation through all these other teachings of the Buddha and taking it as a comprehensive approach of developing this life practice. So if you don't already, get a copy of this book, which you can download if you look in the links of wherever you're watching this, or if you're on Zoom, maybe somebody can post this link for you that you can download this book. Or if you want a printed copy, you can get a printed copy. And there's also an audiobook version as well. You need to start at the beginning and slowly, with guidance, build up your practice and the way that i offer guidance is you can post questions in the facebook group you can contact me privately through private message you can ask questions in these online classes and you can also schedule appointments with me where we meet through video or audio and i provide you personal guidance but you really need to take a dedicated approach of going through these resources of using the book, the videos, the podcast, the quizzes, the audiobook, and these kind of things to really draw in and bring on board this foundation of teachings to get you to the point where you can start approaching and really addressing these 10 major problems that the Buddha discovered, which is called the 10 fetters. We also call them the taints, which is the pollution of the mind. So his teachings are the remedy or the prescription or the medication to address these 10 pollutions or these 10 taints of the mind. And as you eliminate these, the mind becomes more and more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because it's becoming more and more enlightened. But you wouldn't be able to get into those four stages of enlightenment and ultimately enlightenment until you've done all this groundwork. So all this groundwork is kind of preparing the mind with wisdom just to get to the point where you can actually move into these four stages of enlightenment and ultimately attain enlightenment. Thank you, David. We have no more questions. All right. Excellent. Well, I will just say once again that I apologize for coming to class late. I appreciate that you guys stuck around and were interested to learn. I was actually surprised that I got online and all of you guys were in there and interested to learn. I thought that you guys would be gone if I wasn't there in just five minutes. So that's a really nice thing to see that you guys are dedicated and committed. And even we're looking for solutions for reading the chapter out loud, even though the teacher wasn't there. That's what enlightened people do, right? When they're confronted with impermanence, i.e. your teacher doesn't show up, what enlightened people do is they look for solutions they recognize the impermanence for what it is and rather than being discontent rather than being upset rather than being fearful rather than being otherwise just feeling miserable when you're affected with impermanence or you see impermanence you observe impermanence what an enlightened mind is going to do is it's going to look for solutions because an enlightened mind knows that whatever impermanence it's facing 
that itself is impermanent. So in this situation where I showed up and all of you guys were still here and you had discovered and were starting to pursue a solution, which is reading the chapter so all of you guys could start to discuss the chapter, that's exactly what enlightened people do. So when you're confronted with impermanence in your life, whether Chattel, it's your parents talking to you in a way that you would prefer that they don't talk to you, or you come home and you're alone and you don't like to be alone and you're afraid of the dark, or you're at work and there's something that happens at work and you feel like somebody's disparaging your reputation. Any of these things that happen, it's all impermanent. It's not permanent. And what an enlightened mind is going to do is it's going to look for a solution in this situation. Sometimes the solution is do nothing and just remain peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Other times it's take some type of action in order to resolve the situation. And in this situation, you guys chose to read the chapter and actually have somebody read it out loud. That's what was going on when I showed up. So that shows that somewhere along the line, you guys were like, okay, there's some impermanence here. Our teacher didn't show up. Well, what can we do to make this time helpful and productive, even though our teacher isn't here? And that's exactly what enlightened beings are going to do is take a situation and find the solution or the positive in the situation. We have the saying in English, we say when someone throws lemons, you make lemonade, right? That's what we say. And that's essentially what an enlightened being is going to do. When someone starts throwing lemons at you, you make lemonade, right? So if if your parents are talking unkind to you, Chattel, find a way to move past that and don't allow the mind to become discontent. Or if you come home and you're alone, use that as an opportunity to train the mind to feel comfortable being alone. Because if the first thing you do is start calling people out of fear and trying to surround yourself with people, then you're not training the mind. So use that situation where you show up at your home alone and there's typically fear that comes in, use that as like, wow, this is an opportunity for me to train the mind to be alone, and that would be beneficial for me. Or if you're at work and people are disparaging your reputation and they're being hostile and gossiping about you, there's ways to solve that. Either be completely quiet and unaffected or potentially even ask them like, you know, why do you feel that it's helpful to gossip? You know, I wouldn't gossip about you You know, why do you feel like that would be something that would be helpful for our work environment? And if you can say that in a very calm, very peaceful way without fear, because fear is going to make the mind neurotic and uncalm. And then when the the, the mind is neurotic and uncalm, your speech is going to be affected during that time. So if you can remain without fear when somebody is disparaging you and gossiping you, because you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words don't ever hurt me. When you hear this gossip or you hear this negativity that somebody's sending in your direction, if you can just remain unaffected by that, you might be able to talk with these people and help them see that their speech and their actions are destructive to the work environment. And it's not actually helping you as a team to get along and actually accomplish the goals. And maybe not. And maybe you can't help them see it. And maybe you just choose to be quiet. And maybe there's another way to handle it. Maybe you need to talk with HR. Maybe you need to talk with your boss. There's all these different ways to solve these problems in our life. But as long as the mind has craving, desire, attachment, these wants, expectations, these outcomes that it's seeking, and it holds on, as long as the mind has that craving and it has this longing with a strong eagerness, the mind's going to be discontent where when the mind experiences some situation where it's not helpful or there's some impermanence, what an enlightened mind's going to do is it's going to try to find a way to solve that problem rather than sit around and feel negative and oh my goodness, look at me. Nobody likes me. People are talking bad about me. Oh, I'm miserable. I hate this job. I can't stand being here. 
rather than go into those negative cycles where the mind is wired to do that, you've got to spin that and you've got to say, hold on a second. I've got the ability to think positive here. I've got the ability to implement solutions. I've got the ability to not be fearful of this situation that I'm in and I can make lemonade here. Let me make some lemonade. So figure that out when you encounter certain challenges in your life. Because attaining enlightenment doesn't mean that the world's going to be completely perfect when you attain enlightenment because there's still going to be challenges and there's still going to be problems in your life. You've got to take the challenges that are coming at you and apply wisdom to resolve them. And that's what an enlightened being is going to do. Your life is going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because that's the way your mind is going to be. But in situations where you encounter challenges, you will use the wisdom of this path to address that and potentially find solutions. Sometimes the solution is do nothing and just be quiet and walk around it and get to the other side. Other times you might directly address the problems. Other times you might need to involve other people to help you address the problems. But what you don't want to do is be discontent and debilitated and shaken up because of fear. Fear is only going to cause the mind to be neurotic and it's going to inhibit you from going inside the mind, looking at all the wisdom that you have, and then plotting steps to plan to solve this problem. If you allow the mind to become fearful, then the mind's going to be neurotic and it's not going to be able to access that wisdom in the mind because it's just fearful. So if you eliminate these fears, then when certain things happen in your life, you can then directly, calmly, and patiently access the wisdom that's in the mind and address the situation at hand to improve it and make it better. That's how an enlightened mind is going to function. And that's why you've got to get rid of these fears so that you can calmly, patiently respond to these situations rather than react out of fear. Okay? So on Wednesday, we're going to be doing chanting. I'm going to have a session of teaching you guys chanting like I've done in the past. Then on Saturday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. And next Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 19, which is God's creative actions. You have free will. Essentially, chapter 19 is going to help you understand this whole topic of God. Okay, depending on what you've been taught growing up, your mind might have been conditioned in one way or another related to this being of God. You may have no interest in God whatsoever. You may not have any thoughts or understanding of God, and that's fine. You can actually pursue this path, attain enlightenment, liberate the mind without an understanding of God whatsoever. But you can also pursue this path with an understanding of God, but there's certain conditioning that has come along as you've grown up where some people actually fear God. This is one of the reasons why I put this chapter after chapter 18, is because if your mind has an understanding of God and you're walking around fearing God, then you're not going to ever attain enlightenment. So you've got to get to the point where you have a better understanding of this being that we call God and understand how to practice these teachings where you, if you choose, you can maintain this relationship with God while also practicing these good, wholesome teachings to liberate the mind to attain enlightenment. Now, if you decided, you know what, there's no such thing as God. I don't believe in God. There's no way I'm ever interested in God. That's completely fine. I can help you whether you have an understanding of God or whether you don't. But this chapter is really important because In chapter 19, there's a lot of people in the world who either do have an understanding of God or they're interested in having an understanding of God, but they just don't know how to quite do that while also learning and practicing these teachings. So I'm going to help you next week on Sunday to understand how to learn and practice these teachings 
with a relationship with God, if that's what you choose to do, or without a relationship with God. And depending on what you've been taught and depending on what your experiences have been in the past about God, this topic of even talking about God might raise some fear. It might raise some discontentedness. You might be causing yourself some discontentedness based on the way the mind is holding on to certain conditioning of things that you've been taught in the past about God. So what I aim to do on Sunday next week is discuss this chapter 19 about God's creative actions. We all have free will and help you to eliminate that negative conditioning if you choose to help you understand how to practice these teachings with either an understanding of God or no understanding of God whatsoever. It's totally up to you how you choose to approach that, but I will give you guidance in both directions to help you further progress on this path. So I'll see you guys either on Wednesday, Saturday, or Sunday. And in the meantime, get rid of those fears, have some fun with it, Look at the fears that you have, put together a plan, and then gradually work to eliminate them so that the mind can be more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. Thank you for joining and thank you for sticking around and waiting. I'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit BuddhaDailyWisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment. Enlightenment.